Sparlock is back in stores, more about him at the end of the video. This is a children's video made for Jehovah's Witnesses, more concretely, for Jehovah's Witness children. It's a silent video, meaning it's available for kids in every single language because no dubbing is needed. And the message is simple. Your money is better spent as a donation to the religion than on ice cream. But this is obviously not how the religion started, because unlike anything that the Jehovah's Witness religion may tell you, the religion is definitely for profit. And it has been for profit since its inception. When Charles Russell started his evangelizing work, he had no idea he was starting a religion. What he cared about was for people to listen to his ideas. So he did what you did back then and started writing literature. He started publishing books and magazines and developing groups of people to study and promote those books and magazines. Those book clubs or book studies would gather to study the latest book that Russell had come up with. So Russell had a pretty good incentive to keep coming up with books to sell to his followers. And his followers would then promote those books and magazines to other people, indoctrinating them into getting literature so they would convert. None of that was for free, of course. Books and magazines were a commodity back then because I'm told YouTube didn't exist yet. So reading was the main source of entertainment and information for most people. As I recap in my Why Jehovah's Witnesses Preach video, this led to the creation of culpatures, people who believed in the words of Russell and who worked as independent book salespeople. Unlike what the religion would have you believe, culpatures weren't preachers. In fact, after Russell died and Rutherford took over, culpatures were reminded that their job wasn't to preach, it was to sell books. If they wanted to preach, they could rent their own kingdom hall. That's because the religion was made around selling publications. That's how the religion made its money. For a hundred years, they made a religion around selling books to strangers door to door, and even integrated in practicing sales pitches during the midweek meetings as soon as they became a religion, so they could practice selling to other people. Since this is how they made money, this is one of the very few things that women were allowed and even invited to do. Remember, there was no teaching door to door back then, so women could totally go out to sell publications as culprits or later on pioneers while following the misogynist rules from the Bible that forbid them to teach. And this worked out flawlessly generation after generation, finding people door to door to sell literature to, so they could be indoctrinated into finding people door to door to sell literature to. It was a self-perpetuating cycle that grew the religion quite well, from its humble origins as a small publishing house to a large organization with millions of followers publishing books in all languages around the world. By the end of the 80s, the religion was publishing two magazines titles twice a month, selling them for 25 cents each. They had subscribers who would get their magazines delivered by the Jehovah's Witnesses when they went door to door, and sold more expensive, colorful books to both strangers and followers, who would be expected to buy their magazines and books to study during the meetings, just like the religion had been doing since its inception. But then, in 1990, something terrible happened. Things were changing in the United States, and at the beginning of 1990, the US Supreme Court decided to uphold state sales taxes on religious items and books, which would mean the Jehovah's Witnesses would have to start paying taxes for every single thing they sold. The leadership realized that it was over. Paying taxes would complicate things too much, and they would lose a ton of money. Plus, the religion had a strong following now, and the end of the 20th century was upon them. I assume that's what they were thinking when they decided to respond by basically saying how they would no longer ask for a specific amount of money when distributing literature door to door. I imagine the leadership was congratulating themselves behind closed doors. They would still receive close to a similar amount of money from the books and magazines they sold, and they would avoid paying taxes because they would be asking for donations, and donations are not taxable. There's no way this could go wrong. Except, of course, it went terribly wrong. Between them no longer getting money from literature and the death of printed media, their fate was sealed. I have no more than empirical and circumstantial evidence to deduct this, but it's in the 90s when their growth plateaued, and I don't think that's a coincidence. 
At first, Jehovah's Witnesses were enthusiastically giving books away and asking for donations, which they were encouraged to place in separate pouches to keep until the next meeting when they could empty the coins into the donation box. But soon, they realized that asking for donations wasn't working out. Because of course it wasn't. Not only were they receiving less money, but they were converting fewer people. Think about it. If you were the kind of person who buys magazines to read, which ones would you read first? The ones you paid for or the ones you got for free or close to? I remember very early in my childhood hearing adults saying how people just didn't appreciate publications enough once they were free. And they would be annoyed when in their return visits to try and sell them their next magazine for a donation, the housekeeper hadn't even bothered reading the first publication they had placed. And you see that in the religion too. The entire department in charge of making hardcover books was phased out once they realized they couldn't make their books more expensive with free labor. Since the religion quickly realized that most people simply took the literature and placed donations in the box whenever. This led to funky looking literature being released to the Jehovah's Witnesses when leftover materials from books they were no longer going to make were used to make the last batches of sing books and other books that were more common. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in the governing bodies Wednesday meetings when they realized that they actually knew nothing about business when a single decision brought down one of the largest Christian publishing companies in the world. But then they realized they don't make money out of printing books. They make their money out of the free labor they can exploit to make assets. And that's how the religion started shifting from a publishing company into a construction company. When I was a little kid being indoctrinated at Kingdom Halls in Mexico, the religion was expecting persecution from the Mexican government. So the halls were usually somewhat out of sight and looked like plain buildings. The first Kingdom Hall I remember was walled off, so you couldn't really see into the area unless the gates were open. And the second Kingdom Hall I went to was built behind a house. These halls were often co-owned by the elders, and we were told that they were built like that because Armageddon was coming and our place of worship wasn't as important as our spiritual food, the publications. But then, by the end of the 90s, construction began on what the religion called approved Kingdom Halls in our city. Finally, we were going to have one of those nice kingdom halls that we saw in dramas with lots of space everywhere instead of a claustrophobic, often windowless room. Every Jehovah's Witness in the city helped build it and everyone was so excited about finally having a dedicated kingdom hall because, of course, you can only dedicate to God buildings that the religion has direct control over. And it didn't stop there. Soon, there were talks of building kingdom halls all over the city and even about a large project for an assembly hall, which we were all invited to go and build. I remember at least three times in two years being taken into the assembly hall in construction to hear a talk about the importance of generosity to support this project. I vividly remember a talk from an invited Bethelite who was supervising the construction project, reading how Israelites collected their gold to make a false statue but now we would collect our gold to praise Jehovah. Then he showed us his ring finger to show he had donated his wedding ring to the cause and urged people who didn't have money to donate their rings too. I wish I had jewelry to donate and I emptied my pockets in the donation box to show how I wanted to support Jehovah. Because what Jehovah's Witnesses seem to forget very quickly is that the religion doesn't pay for the development of the halls. The followers do. Witnesses both pay for the hall and build the hall with their own hands. And once they're dedicated to Jehovah, the ownership shifts to the religion for it to add it to its portfolio of other real estate projects to play and shift around with. The importance between Jehovah's Witness literature and Kingdom Hall started to switch. Whereas before the most important thing ever was the spiritual food and Kingdom Halls were just where you talked about it, now Kingdom Hall started to become the most important place to be and the quality of the information no longer mattered as much. Now it was all about building, dedicating, and maybe selling, but only to build and dedicate better kingdom halls. The religion got a renewed grip on all of the multiple properties around the world that they controlled, and consolidated power over them by ensuring all buildings were directly under the legal control of the religion to take advantage of the real estate market. And once they took over Kingdom Halls, they started shifting people around to free up real estate to sell and gaslit their followers into moving out of the Kingdom Halls they themselves had paid for. They have us going to the South Congregation and everybody else from our group is going to North. Yeah, I saw that. My aunt and cousins will be going there too. Well, that doesn't make any sense. They should keep you together. I saw your name on the list for the South Congregation but your grandkids and their families, they're going to North. 
So what are you gonna do? What do you mean? Well, are you going to north or are you going to south? Now, sweetie, didn't you say you saw my name listed under the South Congregation? Yeah, but... So, I'll be going to the South Congregation. Whereas before, congregations were somewhat independent in how they managed their kingdom halls. Now, congregations were being broken apart and dispersed, dissolving the congregations that built, paid for, and maintained the kingdom hall for years, releasing valuable real estate and giving the religion the massive boost of money they need. One of the broadcasts a little while ago, Brother um, Lucioni mentioned that uh, we needed about 1,200 new kingdom halls. Well, uh, after a master plan was established, uh, it was found out we don't need that many new kingdom halls. What we need to do is better utilize the kingdom halls that we have. And so it's estimated that we may need 200 or less kingdom halls because of this beautiful master plan, non-construction solutions. We had uh, over 100 or about 195 overcrowded auditoriums, auditoriums with more than four congregations. But after merging and relocating congregations, better utilizing congregations, with the 30 studies that are represented in this report, we're down to now only 32 overcrowded auditoriums. So you see the benefit of initiating this uh, master plan. And that represents, uh, that represents over $100 million in savings. This is from a leaked internal clip, showing how the process worked in the background, grabbing kingdom halls, dissolving congregations, and freeing up millions of dollars in real estate in a matter of months. Nowadays, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that they need to keep building kingdom halls and other buildings for the expansion of the work, with the leadership building more and more remote translation offices and other office spaces that they can immediately sell right after they're done using it. All you need to do is to convince their followers that the religion needs them to build more stuff, despite the fact that they haven't even seen any significant growth for over a decade now. It's hard to measure how effective this approach has been, but I assume it can't be as good as selling publications because, after all, you do need a constant supply of free workers to keep building a constant supply of kingdom halls. And I don't think they can make and sell as many buildings to compensate for the huge loss of no longer being able to monetize the world's most printed magazine. And they still had to come up with spiritual food. Since they couldn't make money with printed publications, but the followers had already been primed to expect them, they became a liability instead of an asset. They couldn't make money out of spiritual food anymore, so after a lot of growing pains, they realized that they could be the last ones to jump into the internet train and distribute spiritual food there. But here's where the disconnect of Jehovah's Witnesses comes into play. When they stopped selling publications, they didn't say to their followers that it was because they wanted to avoid paying taxes. They told everyone that they were doing this because the end was near and God would provide and what was important was to get the information out there as much as possible. They had gaslit their followers into believing that the work was beyond the money so well that they believed it themselves. Now content is king and regular content behind a paywall or with ads is how publishing companies work nowadays. If Russell was alive today, he'd be making content against religion on YouTube or let's be honest on Rumble and would make the religion about his subscriber count and about the mugs he sells or something. But Jehovah's Witnesses have strayed so far from their original business model, they can no longer outright sell things. They had to streamline their operation, reduce the number of books and magazines that were being printed, and spend a ton of money hosting videos to replace their free publications instead of getting paid by monetizing their content as they did for well over a hundred years. Conventions and assemblies before big money makers thanks to the sale of books and food we're now a financial burden that they kept up because it's what they had been doing all this time. They weren't selling anything anymore. They had always prided themselves on not asking money at events or meetings, and they had to make them look so important that they couldn't just remove them altogether when they stopped becoming profitable. And we're not even going to get into the millions they have had to pay in settlement for cases of child abuse and whatnot. Suffice to say, the Jehovah's Witness religion needs money, and it needs money now. If they couldn't get money from strangers in exchange for propaganda and they can't make enough money from real estate, they could always turn back to their followers. Now, this wouldn't be ideal, their followers are the most uneducated Christians out there as we've explored before, but it could work. After all, 
they no longer have to spend time and resources writing articles about science and nature to try to appeal to a wider market because they can make money on the wider market. And this takes us back to the ice cream money from the beginning because GW.org makes the most amount of money from donations, including the donations from children themselves, who are taught to deprive themselves of comfort to give that money to the religion. They start the manipulation process, of course, by saying they're not asking for donations. As you know, for over 130 years, this organization has never solicited for funds, and it is certainly not going to start now. They know that their followers have very little money, and they know that they would call them out for going back on their word for not asking for donations. So they pretend that's not what they're doing when that's exactly what they're doing. Money. Now, the fact is uh, we never beg for money, but that's not to say we can't talk about money in Jehovah's organization, the earthly part. So it is longstanding there is a balance here. You know, going back to the Watchtower, I said a very long time ago, we have never considered it proper to solicit money for the Lord's cause after the common custom, referring to Christendom. It is our judgment that money raised by the various begging devices in the name of our Lord is offensive, unacceptable to him, and does not bring his blessing either upon the givers of the work accomplished or the work accomplished, so we do not need to be coerced into giving. We gladly use our money to support kingdom activities. So that stands to this day, but uh, we'd never want to come to the conclusion you can't talk about money. They're only letting you know that they don't have enough money and your heart can compel you to do whatever you want. This is a slimy way of manipulating people because it implies that if your heart doesn't compel you to give money, then there's something wrong with you. They don't just come out and say, hey, can you give us money? Because then they may either get a yes or a no. If they frame it like this, they either get good people who donate or bad people who don't donate. Because you see, if you stop donating, it'll stop the life-saving work that they do. The service committee, under the direction of the governing body, is expanding and accelerating the life-saving preaching work right up to the end. See, they want you to feel like they're too focused saving lives to do what you do and get a job. Their work is way too important for that. This is a double-edged argument since it implies that they're doing more important work than you are, so the least you can do is to support them financially. But it also protects them from criticism. Because if they're doing life-saving work, then of course they can ask for money. How dare you even suggest saying something negative about them? Why are you throwing mud at the religion when you aren't doing anything for the world yourself? All our contributions have a meaningful share in supporting kingdom interests worldwide. Each donation is like a gift in hand to our Heavenly Father, Jehovah. When we give from our heart, we are expressing our love for Him. And that is the best gift we can give him. This toxic positivity inundates the mind of their followers, silencing any criticism, regardless of how valid that is. Because them being criticized is perceived as equal to hate speech and somehow an obstacle to their work. Some of the best, most trustworthy charities and activists will be happy to show you how much they receive and how it's spent because they understand that, although not needed, transparency goes a long way if you're asking someone for their hard-earned money. The Jehovah's Witnesses go the other way and pretend that even making questions is hatred. Think about it. There's no respectful way of, say, asking Jeffrey Jackson about the sexual abusers currently hiding in their database. If a reporter asked him and pressed him on it, he will later retell that story as the story of how he defended himself against a hateful reporter from Satan's system of things. After all, don't you see they're doing so much good work? Don't you see all the things that they're doing? There is no other organization that compares to Jehovah's organization. Everything the organization provides and helps with is free of charge. But Jehovah invites all of us to give to him or contribute our material resources according to what we personally decide. The Jehovah's Witness leadership has this almost masturbatory sense of achievement where everything they do is blown out to be a huge accomplishment that could only be accomplished if Jehovah was blessing them. 
And you wouldn't want to avoid supporting an organization that Jehovah is blessing, right? There was a lot of obstacles to overcome, and those were overcome little by little, but we started to see Jehovah's hand as seemingly impossible uh, obstacles began to be removed. Psalm 127 and verse one says, unless Jehovah builds the house, it is in vain that the builders work hard on it. Seeing Jehovah's direction firsthand through the various phases convinces us that the success of this project is not dependent on favorable circumstances, the skill of the workers, or even the hard work of those involved. Building this new branch is only possible because of Jehovah's blessing. Everything they do is shown as the best thing ever. They don't just find some buildings, use free labor to renovate them and sell them at a profit. They're building for Jehovah. Everything they do has to be incredible, with them filming badly produced documentaries to show themselves as the experts from a proper documentary and give themselves importance. They love pretending to be more than a dwindling high control group and pretend their religion is unique and not one of many obscure Christian sects that the vast majority of people don't take seriously. And they do this not only by overly exaggerating their accomplishments, making it look like the very ordinary and boring work they do with your donations is actually impressive and awe-inspiring. They also remind you that they did all of that despite the biggest baddie of them all, the devil himself. The authorities in Norway have threatened to remove our legal registration because of our scriptural beliefs and practices regarding disfellowshipping. In the future, Various governments will challenge our freedom of worship. They may pressure us to change our scriptural beliefs, but we're certainly not going to do that. For the Jehovah's Witness leadership, the devil is present pretty much every time that things don't go their way. He manipulates the world around them so well that you just have to donate to support their fight. Anything that's bad for them is, for some reason, good for Satan. The devil rejoices to see Jehovah's Witnesses separated over asking questions instead of united to fight against them. Satan, however, is just a placeholder culprit to cover their own incompetence at best or their own crimes at worst. For example, apostates like me regularly call out Watchtower for their abusive child abuse policies, where the system is made to protect the brand instead of the children. The Jehovah's Witness religion minimizes the issue to pretend it's only down to some bad people doing bad things and blame Satan for saying otherwise. Another way we can contribute to the oneness, rejecting false stories that are designed to separate us from Jehovah's organization. As an example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. This has a dual effect. First, it makes them feel important. They are alone fighting against Satan himself, this vague force that you cannot listen to that's extremely powerful. And it literally demonizes anyone with valid criticism for the religion immediately silencing anyone who even begins to suggest a connection between their need for money and their need to pay child abuse settlements in court. All they want you to know is that they have some vague legal issues and that Satan is behind them and that you are in a unique place to help them with your donations. They don't want anyone to look into why they're having legal issues, because then you'd realize that the issues don't come from Satan, come from their victims who are finally speaking out. This toxic positivity inundates the whole religion and is especially apparent when they pretend they're not asking for donations because they instead highlight how your donations can only be used for something positive. Can I give this to our brothers affected by the hurricane? Of course you can. We'll put it in the contribution box on Sunday. My piggy bank was empty. I guess I can't help. There are many things you can do to help. First, you can save some money for next time. Jesus felt the same way when he was here on earth. Do you remember what he said when he helped the leper? I want to! Yes, he did what he could to help others. 
just like you. That makes us very proud of you. Once you get followers to believe these BS, they will self-police. There's no rule that says you can't question where donations go. In fact, they even pay lip service to transparency when they give witnesses a recap of how their donations were used in the congregation. Witnesses know, however, not to ask for more than that, and to instead assume that the money is going to a good cause, almost as a proof of their faith. Trusting that the governing body will do the right thing is a righteous thing to do. The governing body could be likened to the voice of Jesus, the head of the congregation. So when we willingly submit to the faithful slave, we're ultimately submitting to Jesus' authority and direction. This environment makes it so anybody who even thinks negatively about them asking for donations to be immediately labeled as an opposer. You can't say anything that's not glowingly positive. Even if you see something, you should shut up because questioning them equals being against them. If the conversation turns negative, get out. Satan is behind the twisted teachings of apostates. He's the father of the lie. And those who lie are doing exactly what their father does. The apostates have nothing to offer us, brothers. All they have to offer is hate. All they have is, uh, to offer is criticism and negative talk. They will use any and every trick in the book to keep their followers from asking a very simple question. Should I support this organization? Instead, they gaslight and manipulate people, so even formulating that question itself is tantamount to an insult, a betrayal of who you are and what you're supposed to represent. If they are the words of apostates, why would we believe them? This obviously isn't how trustworthy corporations or people work. Honest people don't need to silence questions because there are no questions that can break them. That's the benefit of being truthful. You don't need to heavily and unapologetically remove anyone who asks questions if you're not afraid of people wondering what the answer may be. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Jehovah's Witnesses or any other religion or charity shouldn't ask for money. Obviously, that's not the argument I'm making. Thousands of nonprofits ask for money and show people how it's used as an incentive for people to give them more money. GW.org doesn't need to manipulate people to ask for money. They can simply say, hey, we're all human, we all need money, here's a general breakdown of how your donations are used so you can help us out. But they can't do that because they're a shady organization. They don't believe they owe anyone any explanation for how they use the money that their followers give them. That money is the salary paid to them by God himself and only he can judge what they do with it as his faithful and discreet servant. They have to manipulate people into donating with lies and exaggerations because they fear people wouldn't donate if they showed the boring truth. That they're a dwindling sect with no future in sight and no idea of how to run anything. And identifying these patterns of behavior is a huge part of waking up from indoctrination. Because if we don't identify them, we can fall victim to that same manipulation tactics even long after we stop believing in Jehovah.